Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. The Lacey Brooks Pack, Killing Moon, Part 2. There was nothing there I saw for myself, Sheriff Cloud tiredly informed his friends. We can't afford ground-penetrating radar or anything, but there's no sign that the facility was anything but what the sign on it said, a maintenance property. State records state the same. We brought in dogs. They just laid on the ground or ran out of the garage. Odd, but not really evidence. Gene held up his hand. I know what that means, but it's not proof enough to break down a concrete wall or two. I put up my own camera while we were on the premises. It's not fancy, but we can monitor whether anybody opens the garage doors. It's the best we can do for the moment. Earl nodded. We know you did your best, Gene. Freaky that they disappeared. The hounds, though, the ones that the two deliverance-type losers used. They tracked Lady Godiva, the female Sasquatch, without any fuss. Even Minister, Val interjected. Earl smiled. I can explain that one. Caught a whiff of them at the garage before they wheeled me inside. They are descended from dogmen. After about three or four generations, they go back to looking and acting more like dogs. By the fifth, they are dogs once more. Still bigger and smarter than the average, but true canids. I've often wondered whether Lacey and Oscar were remakes, descended back to the dog only to be transformed again. They were both pretty smart before they changed into what they currently are anyway. I know we have plenty to do. It's just interesting with, with all the transmogrified creatures. Val patted the sheriff's arm. Thanks, Jean. I think we've done all we can for the moment. These guys clearly have some backers. I got hold of my boss. I'm not fired or anything. In fact, I'm off until Monday. I told them a little about being kidnapped by rural drug manufacturers. The stuff on which we decided. Earl and I will meet with the pack tonight. You want in on it? Sheriff Cloud grinned. Why not? The old lady's used to me going out at all hours. She's sweet about it, and it's Friday, so the kiddos will stay up late or go out with their friends. We may even get to watch our weekly horror movie together, after we take care of meeting with the genuine horror beings. He paused and looked abashed. I almost forgot. We found your Jeep. GPS shows it at the bottom of the river channel, slowly rolling towards the lake bottom. I'll get you a copy of the report for your insurance. I'm sorry about it, but maybe you can get a rental car until they cut you a check. So, the Z-Tech are fully under control? The keeper asked his new friend, Darwinius Narcissa, the only other person with free will who was not unconscious. Yes, they're good. I walked the corridor. You have several specimens that appear to have been subject to zombification. You realize it will not be effective with the entire technique. There are spells. The keeper laughed aloud and sarcastically. <laughs> yeah, we know about your spells. Got it all recorded and it works just fine. Narcissa was outraged but also concerned because he knew that a frailed process could result in immediate psychosis and even violence. He needed this cretin to understand. You can copy the process to a point. But it is organic, and it must be adjusted to each individual. With monsters, we don't even know if they have the minds to affect. This is highly dangerous, and you are doing it only to keep from paying what I am owed. I don't care, though. This thing has gotten crazy. I want to leave. Can't. The keeper shook his head in pretended regret. We're under lockdown until Dr. Z recovers or dies. You saw the monitors. Law dogs snooping around and banging on the walls. The group that escaped, including that hot piece. So somebody was able to tell them where we were. I still don't care. I wish to leave. I know you rats will have an exit, so you won't let yourselves be trapped forever. 
The keeper mimicked a person in deep thought. Of course. We have a bolt hole. <laughs> we even have a hatch down below that will flood the place. That's why they built the zoo below the surface of the lake. Look, I'd get you your money if I had access to it. But without Dr. Z, my hands are tied. You know, though, that he has deep pockets. He just wanted control, not to cheat you. He put on his best helpless helper expression. Hey, maybe we can get you out. You can come back and check in a few days. If the doctor's recovered, we'll all get paid. If not, well, maybe we can sell the critters. Narcissa stared at the insincere man who had done his best to seem reasonable. I haven't created zombies for over 20 years without learning a thing about human nature. This one is sly, but thinks that everyone else is a fool, he decided. Then, show me the way. I am in no mood for tricks. The zombies will need attention in another two weeks or so. If we wait longer, the venom and spells will start to fade. In the meantime, you must tell the doctor to stop using the venom on monsters. It'll end up causing nothing but harm. The keeper nodded enthusiastically. Oh, I will warn him, and you will get the credit. Perhaps even a reward for helping him with his experiments. If you're ready, we'll go to the emergency exit. Darwinius eyed the keeper suspiciously, but had a few options. I'm ready. Let's go. They descended the stairs down below the main corridor. Narcissa questioned the direction. You said that an opening below the water would flood the place. What game are you playing? The keeper turned and smiled reassuringly. No games. That's one hatch. The one where we're going to lead into a tunnel and up to the surface out in the woods. Pretty far from here. Sorry, I should have explained that. They continued on, following a few turns, and then they came to a plain door. Here we go. I'll open the portal and then leave you to your exit. Come back in what, ten days? Narcissa nodded. Yes, but that will be my last visit no matter what. I don't like people attempting to steal the secrets of my craft. There's a reason that few are inducted into the mysteries of voodoo. He paused. It's very dark inside. Must I feel my way? Carlos Forrest laughed. No, just walk inside. The lights will activate when the sensors detect you. The witch doctor stepped into the dark space, and the keeper closed the door behind him and ensured it was locked. He then proceeded back up to the corridor level to watch the fun. He made it to the cage he'd selected in the larger paddocks with creatures that preferred live food. There was an additional feeding mechanism to drop the drawer. When he arrived, he activated the elevator in which Narcissa was entrapped and raised him up through the floor like a capsule in a pneumatic tube at a bank or a pharmacy. He cackled. <laughs> Fitting that Narcissa, the man of dark magic, should be devoured by the oversized black cat. He thoroughly enjoyed the next several minutes and wrung his hands in glee when the cat stuffed the remains of its prize, carcass, up in a fake tree, out of habit. He turned away and headed for the stairs that led up to the office suite, when he heard the heavy tread of a party descending them. Keeper, what are you doing sulking around down here? I should feed you to the Gugway. Dr. Z was awake. Gene got his vehicle into the turnaround, passing space beside the Piney Creek Bridge. The moon was set to rise at any moment, so Lacey and company would be along at any moment. She was like her dad. She preferred to be early and scout rather than be late and caught flat-footed. I wish Tom could have come along, but, but I have to have someone reliable supervising the night crew, especially on a Friday night. Now that the weather's warmed back up to normal, folks are getting spring fever and wanting to get rowdy. I reckon so, Earl rumbled quietly as he gazed out into the deep darkness under the trees. He rolled down his window and scented the breeze in hopes of smelling the pack. He knew that they'd never approach from upwind, but thought he could have some fun if they made a slip. 
He discovered that much of the Canaan and Lupine community occurred through scents. It was a reason that so many animals seemed to be canny. They could smell a mood and anticipate action based on that perception. People referred to it as sensing, and it was, in the purest definition, the sense of smell. It wasn't anything supernatural. Like the myriad things he'd learned to live the life, he discovered that it was a mundane sense, performed to a high degree. He snorted. Humans use their eyes like birds. Maybe that makes them bird brains. Nah, even birds have more effective beaks than two legs. They don't rely completely on one sense. He had to explain the humor to Val and Jean. They pretended to get it. But he knew that unless one had possessed the ability, he'd never truly understand. He caught a familiar odor with his now noticeably less effective olfactory sense. But he knew that unless one had possessed the ability, he never truly understand. He caught a familiar odor with his now noticeably less effective olfactory stents. Still better than when I was a simple man, dogman, or woman? young woman. Adele! He exclaimed and leapt from the back seat. Grandpa! His granddaughter greeted him. He was relieved that he could still understand, if not fully speak, their common language. They held one another for a moment. They now stood at roughly the same height. When they stepped back, she looked at him carefully. They said that you'd changed, morphed back into something like a two legs. You still stink a little of wolf, but you smell better than you did before you went bald all over. Thank you for coming for me. I'm sorry that they caught you, but I'm glad you're cured. Once you eat a few more meals, you may even be able to catch up. As long as the rest of us poke along like turtles. She laughed in her doggy humor, and Earl laughed with her, overjoyed that she seemed so like her normal self. He'd feared long-term effects from the drugs they had given her at the lab. Val and Jean stood by, nonplussed, and having no concept of the depth of conversation that had just occurred. They saw only gestures and heard some odd noises, with Earl filing a few words which he could no longer produce sounds or smells. Val hugged and scratched Adele. She'd already greeted Lacey and Oscar. Earl, too, was on the rear guard, but waved at her in a copied human gesture. So glad to see you back to n normal, sweet girl. I'm going to hurt somebody for what they did to you and Uncle and Earl. Adele made some noise and gestures, and Earl gape grinned. Adele says, get in line. She wants to hurt them first. I'll let the two of you figure out a system since they kidnapped you too, Valerie. Now the big question is, how do we get into that facility and set free all other beings and creatures? Jean participated in planning as far as he felt comfortable. They were, after all, contemplating murder. Or was it? The pack members were mostly animals. Kind of. If they killed anybody, it would be predation rather than homicide. He couldn't believe he was having the conversation. Much less with whom or what. No, whom. He reminded himself emphatically... In any case, he could wash his hands of it after tonight. He'd offered to get Earl an identification of some kind, but the big, now bigger, man assured Jean that he had his own connections for such matters and didn't want Sheriff Cloud taking such a great career risk. Odd. He looks different enough, but is clearly still Earl. He sure is ripped. Wonder what that workout routine he used. He was getting a little bored when the members of the pack, other than Val, stiffened and quickly faded into the brush. Car coming, Earl informed Val and Jean. Probably a local. It was, and Jean waved to them as they passed on the muddy roadway. We're almost done. I just have to figure out transportation for the larger members of our pack. Maybe we should take the truck back to its owner. If nobody has come for it, we may as well put it to use. Not sure how many weirdos and mad scientists are left alive. They may be too short for personnel to send anyone to get the thing. Jean agreed to let them take the truck. It would save his people a detail watching, 
and they hadn't yet entered into the crime network as stolen. Earl drove the boxy thing to the car rental facility, and Val picked up a small sedan to use until her insurance claim was complete. She had a feeling that she would be toiling hard during the next week, between catching up at work and taking care of personal matters. Fortunately, the partners had been impressed with her work so far and would be lenient. Besides, with the police reporter, they were concerned for her well-being. She and Earl met the drowsy pack members and the two tall Sasquatches back at Piney Creek late that afternoon. They could all sleep in the back of the truck on the way home, back down to the lake area. Earl and Val had stocked the back of the panel truck with supplies so that everyone, everything, would have a full belly without having to stop and hunt or forage. They'd been limited on what they could buy. Earl had contacted his friends with connections for acquiring identification. He briefly considered having his death certificate annulled, but that would cause more problems than solutions. Besides, he wasn't completely the same man as he had been. The biggest short-term problem would be funds. He had to pay for services and for life in general. He had closed all of his accounts or left them to other people when possible, since he had seen no way for a werewolf to use them. At the moment, he was a bum. However, he knew that there would be some money from what they were about to do. Possibly a lots of money. Monster hunting had the potential for substantial dividends as long as the right people knew one was doing it. His thoughts eventually turned to Val. I can't keep mooching off that girl. She makes decent money, but she just bought a house and really should concentrate on one career at a time. I always thought she was dynamite, but now... I'm feeling very drawn to her. I don't know whether it's just physical or a byproduct of the emotional strains we've both suffered recently. Probably both. There's no time for that stuff, and no matter how much better I feel, I'm still an old man. Well, not quite 60, but still. The intercom from the back intruded on his thoughts. He glanced at the monitor and saw that Lacey stood in the center of the space I see you, dear. I have to watch the road, so I may miss a few things and ask you to repeat yourself. Is anything wrong? Lacey gape grinned. <laughs> Nothing, Dad. We were just talking and worrying about you. You'll have to return to two-leg life. We thought you might be concerned, too, so we wanted you to know we'd welcome you in our territory, despite your new impaired state. Earl thought for a moment before he replied. Yes, sweetie, I'm concerned. However, I do feel better as this new person than I did in my old wreck of a body. I'm not as strong as fast as Earl Wolf, but I'm not truly less. I think I'm something else altogether. I would be honored to live in your territory. <laughs> we are family, a pack after all. He received four gape grins at that and lolling tongues that indicated exceptional pleasure from his grandchildren. Lacey winked. You may bring Val if she wants to come, although I will always think of her as sister rather than stepmother. With that, she resumed her seat beside Oscar, and she and Lady Godiva went back to their language lessons and left Earl with a new and startling concept to consider. So, Dr. Z, we're going to go ahead with the great plan? The keeper nervously inquired. Dr. Z glared at his assistant. Do you know what the great plan is? No, no, sir, not really. But I'm on board to help any way I can. I've made a good living working for you, but I ain't rich. I have no work record for the past several years, even if people are hiring. Well, I couldn't find anything to do that is as satisfying as my work here's been. I think following your plan is the best thing for me to do, Carlos responded with sincerity. Dr. Z regarded him silently for a moment, and his glare resolved into his normally stern but patient expression. Agreed. Besides, we will need someone to wrangle the Z-Tex, since most of our living assistants are dead. At the keeper's look of confusion, he added, The ones who are off duty during the raid are waiting for us. 
When we went on lockdown, I followed a protocol ordered by the operators and set them to the other preparatory tasks, namely packing and loading the products of our lab. There are only three, and they will operate the transport that will remove us via the back portal down below. Once our Ark of Monsters is loaded, we will return to the facility to the lake. He did not speak of his own escape hatch at ground level. He needed the Keeper to mind the creatures for just a bit longer. He looked forward to the near future, during which he would shed his human shepherds and replace them with Z cryptids. There were still nine Z techs in decent enough shape for the interim. He'd keep the new Z cryptids and the best of the Z techs and commend the rest to the depths of the lake when it flooded the facility. So, last time I parked here, I was kidnapped and my car was stolen. Hope we can do better as a team, or a pack. Val joked a little nervously. She really wanted a firearm. Then she recalled the tale that Lacey had relayed to her about how they'd come together in the Z-Lab. Say, Lacey, do you think we could round up Charlie and Don's weapons from where you nabbed them? They should still be in working order unless you smash them. Earl, too, stepped forward. I'll go get them if you like, Mother. Adele can come along and see where we caught them. Shouldn't take long. Lacey nodded her acquiescence, and the two young dog folk drove into the woods with youthful abandon. She understood that Adele needed to be part of the action. It would give she and Oscar time to reconnoiter the facility. The Squatch couple decided to stay nearby to protect what they considered the helpless two-leg members of their strange tribe. Pack as the others said. So, big dude, how you feeling? Val asked Earl once they were alone, at least as far as her limited human sensory perceptions could tell. She was a little worried about her feelings and his. His changes seemed to have slowed or perhaps stopped completely. He appeared not youthful, but vigorous and strong like a young man, though he carried himself with mature dignity and his hair was shot with silver here and there. Still a slight crinkle around the eyes, she saw. Maybe just laugh lines. He was always one to smile. He didn't answer immediately. He was sunk in his own thoughts. I'm all right. He considered leaving it at that, but then swiveled his head to face Valerie. So are you going to ask about my contacts? How I will be able to put my life back in order and repay you? She shrugged. I really haven't had time to think about it. In fact, we've talked about you being retired, but never about from what. She let the statement hang in the air, an almost unasked question, then played off her concerns over his answer with a flippant response of her own. Let me guess, you were some kind of double-knot spy like Jethro Bodine. She smiled, but feared that maybe he wasn't retired from anything Maybe he'd been a crook, or a day laborer connected with crooks. His home and property had spoken of some money. She always assumed he'd worked in private industry. Maybe the energy sector? Now she anticipated his response and dreaded it all at once. She wanted desperately to continue to respect this man. Earl grinned. Nope, folks raised me better than to go into something so sneaky as spying. I spent a hitch in the army and then finished undergrad. Nothing crazy. I thought hard about being a game warden, but shortly before I graduated, I stumbled it into an opportunity and decided to do some government contracts. I traveled to other countries and helped out with security and taught some of the locals about jurisprudence as applied to the now former USA and other lost democracies. He paused to wink. Plus, the money was too good to pass. I intended to do it for just a year or two, but I ended up working for him for over five. Got to see more of the world than I ever thought possible. Mostly places no one would want to go, but I managed to get over to some of the touristy locales along the way. I came home with a nice grub steak and no real ideas. So I went back to school for my master's in forestry and wildlife management. I'd considered the game warden gig again, but the complexities of state employment turned me away from it. So I taught high school for a while. He raised his palms. 
I know. Teaching is a state employment when it comes to pay and benefits, but hiring and personnel are at the county ISD level. I met Rhonda while I was back in school. She was a law student then. He paused for a moment. He always seemed reticent when it came to discussing his wife and her fate. I taught because it was a steady, stable job, and it seemed like the right thing to do with an impending marriage in the hope of starting a family. It was nice for a few years. When Rhonda died, I didn't want to be around a bunch of people at one time anymore, so I worked for timber companies for a few years. More money in that than teaching, and a great deal more solitude. He shrugged and crossed his arms. I liked being in the woods, and I enjoyed managing the growth and leaving space for wildlife. I did not like the idea of what would happen to those woods later, but I understood the necessities, and I truly loved the forest. I may have even hugged a tree or three. He exhaled a short bark of laugh. In the end, I retired from that and went back to contracting before I retired for good. Same company, different name. And only a few years this time. I just wanted to reconnect with the rest of the planet before I settled into retirement and true isolation in a single, if large, patch of woods adjacent to my old timber company land. I taught almost solely on those latter contracts and didn't have to rough it up as much fighting turds. Just as well, the years had taken a toll on my body. His eyes grew distant for a moment. Even being assigned as an just an instructor can be dangerous in some parts of the world. I ended up in one last shitstorm of a fight when the opposing parties decided to attack a military and police training facility. Did some good, caught some injuries, and managed to save a few lives among my fellow contractors. They're still in the game and now in management. Hopefully in repayment, my one friend in particular, will apply their connections to replace what I need. I'll reach out as soon as we know whether we'll survive the current operation. His smile returned as he once again shelved the painful sight of his memories, and Val determined that she had never gazed upon a more handsome man in her life. He was better than average when she considered it in objective terms but she was no longer felt objective. From the way he looked back at her, she knew that he'd lost his objectivity as well. You lived an amazing life, Earl. You've had some adventure, some education, that I suspect, but you never knew. And you worked on a regular job, one that interested you. It would have been an amazing journey for you, despite the painful interludes. Then you lived as a werewolf, but found a cure? Plus, you dig chicks who study law. She leaned in a little closer, and they were about to be swept up in the moment. A brush rustled, and two grinning young dog people's faces appeared, followed by the rest of them and some objects, long and small. We got the guns, Grandpa, Earl too proclaimed as he thrust a shotgun and a bundle that contained other weapons and ammunition towards Earl. Adele, more perceptive than her brother in emotional affairs, morphed her grin into a shy smile and silently handed over her haul to Aunt Valerie. She suspected that she might soon be able to call her Granny, which would make her mad in a funny way. She gaped. Tongue-lolling grin returned in earnest as she huffed a little cloud of foul breath into the night air. The Keeper entered the lock that led into the hold of the vessel they'd used to evacuate the zoo portion of the facility. He and the z had loaded the bulk of the monsters in the hold of the watercraft. The ship was a little larger for this body of water, yet it would be fine as long as they kept to the center of the river channel once they were underway. They would follow that down to the bay and around to the port of the city. It was a major port, and he assumed that the great plan would begin with chaos in the economically critical location. He'd opened both locks in the facility, and when the boat uncoupled from the docking tube, water would inundate the interior of the structure, all the way up to the ground level. 
those spaces were now emptied, the contents of most rooms now loaded into the vessel. He personally stripped the control room and tossed the electronics down the stairs to the lower levels so they would be taken by the water. He would miss the place in some ways. It had been fun for him to create personal arenas for his perverted pleasures. Yet it was time to move out once more into the great wide world. He'd closed the internal hatch in the ship. It was just above the waterline and sealed nicely. With the latest technology for such devices, he flipped the override level and then pushed the large red button that set the tunnel connection free. He felt the vessel tug slightly and watched the monitor that showed the large tube slip away and bob in the depths for the moment as it filled. There was no going back underground in that place. He let it go and went to check on his various charges. Best check the z first. Without Narcissa, they may need to be disposed of. Could be fun. They'd make great snacks for the Z-cryptids. So many Zeds in my life. Earl looked over at Lacey and shook his head. Weird. This part of the wall is likely a gate of some kind. Lacey nodded. It's exactly where the door was when we came to get you. They searched for some manner to operate the wall drop, but none was apparent. There were tools scattered throughout the garage. Most were simply hung in racks around the walls or stuffed into the lockers or laying on shelves. Earl eventually found what he wanted and shoved the flat end of a pry bar into the thin gap between the floor and the bottom of the wall. He scrounged a block to act as fulcrum and then asked for help from Sir Slamsalot and Lady Godiva. They soon had enough of the door lifted so that the big male was able to grip the bottom and lift it above his head. Earl slipped the door. Ouch. Earl slipped the pry bar into the groove on one side. The doorway behind was still crashed inward, but the rooms on this level were empty. Water sloshed at the edge of the stairwell that led to the lower levels. I wonder if they evacuated first, Val asked, bemused. She had no particular love of cryptids, but didn't like the idea of them being deliberately drowned. Likely, Earl responded. Can't imagine they'd go to all that trouble and expense of creating or capturing, then maintaining all those creatures only to let them die. The remains would deteriorate fast, so they wouldn't have to worry about anyone finding them later. Still, it seems like an awful waste. I think they want to do something with the crud they used on Adele and some of the others. Probably the same stuff that made their slack-jaw human workforce. Zombie juice. We used to make it in high school, but the effects were temporarily increased stupidity and unwarranted inflation of narcissism. This stuff is more powerful in long term. Still causes a stupor. Adele responded. It makes you dream. Mostly peaceful stuff, but sometimes nightmares. She shuddered and offered no more details. Oscar sh patted her shoulder and scratched her back for comfort. They worked as a team to clear the ground floor and then moved up the stairs at the back to investigate the second floor. Earl, too, and Adele worked as rear guard. As soon as the young dog woman cleared the bottom of the stairwell, Another wall door dropped in behind her, effectively hiding the fact that there was a second story. It also meant that they would have to break out or find a different exit to leave. There were cages, like the ones below, but smaller, and clearly designed for short-term use. Other rooms were simple cells, perhaps for human or smaller animals. They found the barracks room where the Z-Tex and Z-Squad members had been housed, with an adjacent restroom and kitchen facility. There wasn't much. Their diet had been simple and their needs few. The zombies lived in a perpetual dream state. The labs were emptied and shelves and tables were bare except for a few standard experimental objects, microscopes and such. The final doorway that stood over where the control room was was closed. It was heavy and clearly locked. Lacey sniffed at the handle and then beckoned for the others to do so in turn, other than Val, of course. 
her two legs smaller, was simply not up to the task. They met a little farther down the hallway. The smell is familiar. It was here when we came. Any idea who? Earl nodded. I know my nose isn't what it was, but the scent is that of Dr. Z, the head of the facility. I don't know much else about him. Adele chimed agreement. Yes, he was the one I met well, briefly. Very old, not well. His scent has altered. Earl gazed at his granddaughter. Agreed. Though I thought maybe it was just my reduced abilities, but there is more vigor in his scent. He shifted his focus to Lacey. So do we leave him in his little office or tear down the door and rend him, assuming he hasn't left through some secret hatch? I would have, he grinned savagely. Lacey thought for a moment. You would also have left something unpleasant behind for anyone who found the office. He may have as well. If he left by some other route, we'd have better luck tracking him from above. Still, this may be an easier way to escape, since the wall came down behind us and we forgot the pry bar. In the end, the squatches once more filled the roll of battlefield tanks and pounded down the door. It was indeed solid, but not meant to withstand their likes for long. As soon as it began to give way, they scuttled back down the hallway to join the others, clearly expecting some strike from behind the splintered barrier. None materialized, and they all stared at the gaping threshold, obstructed by the door that was still attached to at the lower hinges. If there was anyone in the office, they were well hidden. Eventually, Earl strode forward. Time to take a look. Oscar stepped up beside him. You'll need my senses, Dad. Earl nodded and smiled, proud that this magnificent being still thought of him in respectful terms. Oscar ripped the door the rest of the way from the frame and let it fall forward into the room. Earl bounded past him and quickly found that the space was empty. The desk was in place but had been cleared. Oscar loomed in front of a bookcase, his nostrils flaring. His ears swiveled forward. His freshest scent is here, and maybe something else. And maybe something else. A hint that the gas they used on you and Adele. Maybe something more. Hard to tell. I think it's on the other side. Definitely an air current. Get out! Earl shouted and leapt instinctively back over the desk and stretched himself prone. Oscar leapt backward in an attempt to leave through the open doorway, but was far too late. The blast came from the back wall, from behind a picture that had hung there. It took him in his back left flank and exited the other side of his chest. His body flew to one side, then struck the ground and rested with limp finality. Earl scrambled from behind his hiding space. The threat had not been behind the bookcase, but behind an innocuous picture that hung on the wall to one side. It was some sort of small rocket launcher. Oscar lay sprawled on the floor, up against the far wall from the weapon. Blood still flowed from the considerable gaping wounds, and his eyes stared blankly and had already begun to glaze. The others flowed into the room even as he knelt beside the powerful dogman who had always served so valiantly. There was nothing any of them could do. The strongest of their pack was dead. Dr. Z had an appointment to keep. It was a phone conference of vital importance with the operators. I have closed the Southern Wall Woodland Facility. The Ark vessel is on the way to the city. I evacuated a different route and will meet them downtown. The lab and the offices are clear, and anything of interest to explorers is drowned and will shortly be sealed behind fake walls as well. I set the secondary seal to close when they are tripped by moving beings. I expect the facility will have some visitors soon. I set up a few nasty surprises that will have them jumping as shadows by the time they reach my exit. I'll be in place for the next phase of the great plan. It seems our emergency and the needs of the group have coincided. One of the shadowy figures in the video responded, You are not to proceed. 
You are to go at once to the nearest facility and integrate your Z cryptids with theirs. The others are not ready, and the great plan must be executed in concert. As for the experiments in which you have clearly participated in yourself, they were unauthorized but not unappreciated. We will want the data as soon as possible. Something clicked for the foul doctor. These people were unhappy about his saving his own life. And they were not truly committed to the agreed-upon plan. I understood that the great plan was to proceed very soon. We have to evacuate earlier than I planned. Yet we can be already in place in our new facility in the city. When the other labs are ready. I know we will have to be cautious, but we will have progressed immensely in the Z cryptid program. One of the figures shuffled in what the doctor perceived as an uncomfortable manner. Your data is flawed. The Z cryptid program was about to be terminated. It seems that altered creatures do not take well to the zombification process. You may note that the natural creature and the human subjects were quite compliant. Yet those that had been transmogrified experienced reduced effects. When they come out of the zombie state, they become hyper-aggressive and pain-compliant techniques no longer work on them. Dr. Z responded angrily, We have not noticed that effect! One of the council members interrupted, Yours was not to only facilitate to explore the zombification process. I know that's what we told you, but security is more important than potentially hurt feelings. Dr. Z bit back his initial bitter response and nodded. Understood. I would have done the same. However, I strongly urge you to allow me to continue with my current plan. If there is a risk with the cryptids, it would be better to get them into a high-security environment rather quickly than risk moving them further. The transmission muted momentarily, and then a voice spoke once more. Agreed. You may take them to the warehouse. However, you must maintain what you have, and we will expect a full report, with all due data on your present, apparently improved physical condition. Dr. Z simmered his anger and kept it to a low boil. I was forced to use on the serum or die from a heart attack. It seems I have not only fixed the one problem, but several others. I will submit a full report as soon as I can gather my data and conduct some experiments. We had insufficient time before we had to institute the lockdown. His anger eased a little when he saw a notification on his screen that indicated his trap had been sprung and paused to hope that it had wrought maximum damage. I must leave. My pursuers will soon be close behind if not. Earl and the others joined Lacey in a shocked and miserable howl that reverberated through the space and left Val nearly deaf. She sobbed in her own misery, yet they had to get it together. They couldn't pause for grief. They had to keep forging ahead for vengeance and to stop whatever mad experiments were happening that might unleash so many mind-controlled creatures on the human population. Lacey sniffed at the partially opened bookcase then flung it all the way to one side, ignoring any secondary traps that may have been in place. She led the way down the exposed corridor to a steep and narrow stair. It wasn't long, and there was a small door at the top. She had regained at least some modicum of sanity and halted the rest of the pack. Go back to the room and close the funny door. I will open this one and explore for more traps. She gave Earl a meaningful look and he coaxed the others back down the corridor. When they reached the room and pulled the bookshelf back into place, Earl, too, and Adele shifted their father's corpse so that he lay in a more dignified position. His body would quickly dissolve, but the gesture gave them a tiny amount of comfort in that they had displayed some small measure of the respect they held for their parent. Earl helped as best he could. The rest remained on standby, straining to hear whether Lacey had encountered any further disasters. She soon poked her head through the side of the bookcase and then pushed it aside. No more traps. It leads to a patch of brush behind the marina parking area. 
the other side of the highway. She stood over her fallen mate for a moment and then crouched beside him and stroked his face. She reached out and closed his eyes in a human gesture she'd learned from watching old movies. Time to go. I smelled the trail. He must have had a vehicle parked in the marina lot. She peered up at Earl and Val. Perhaps you can see if there's more information in the other office? Cameras? Earl and Val both nodded and left for the general office space. It was night and it would be closed, but they both had skills. It was easy to access the area, and there were indeed monitors for the lot. Just no recording system. They reported back to Lacey and the rest who emerged from the facility and secreted themselves along the banks of the widened river. He could have gone anywhere, Earl opined, though I'm leaning towards the city, the all too big city. They were stymied and every being knew it. Val shrugged. You can all stay at my place. It'll be crowded and you won't be able to go outside. Maybe at night? Lacey shook her head. We'll stay here and keep an eye out for any that return or come by to check. Maybe we can set days to meet. They agreed on the next Friday night, in the nature parking lot. Val looked at Earl. What about you, big guy? You look like you wouldn't mind some indoors. Earl nodded. He wasn't up to a smile just yet. He was still in shock. They all were, and each dealt with it to the best of his or her ability. He hugged Lacey and the grandkids for a long moment, then waved at the squatches. They didn't like touching two legs, especially him with his lingering wolf scent. They left the truck in the little lot and took Val's rental back towards the burbs. The hunt had failed, at least for the moment, and they all needed to grieve their loss. So quoth this raven. Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings.